The transplantation depends on what type it is. For an autologous transplantation, it's really mostly just hospitalization, uh, which can be about three to four weeks. It includes chemotherapy for the first week, which is high-dose intensive chemotherapy, followed by the transplant, which is a stem cell infusion, and then it's a recovery period, during which time the patient's blood counts are low, they may have some side effects with the chemotherapy, um, like mouth sores, nausea, vomiting. We kind of support them through that. And once their blood counts recover, uh, and they're eating and drinking, and they've recovered from all the complications of the chemotherapy, they go home. After that, um, they have some follow-up visits with the, with the transplant doctor, but within two to three months, they're pretty much back to normal. An allogeneic transplant where you get uh, stem cells from a different person, um, it is a lot more complicated. So the first part is still the same. Um, there is, they come into the hospital, they get their high-dose chemotherapy or uh, what's called conditioning regimen. It could also be, uh, it may also involve radiation. And then they get their stem cell infusion from their donor, from their specified donor who has been identified prior to this process. During this time, they are, in addition, they will get drugs that will suppress the new immune system uh, to, provi to prevent graft-versus-host disease. Uh, and uh, so the hospitalization at this point is complicated by recovery from the transplant, uh, recovery from the chemotherapy that was given prior to transplant, as well as uh, complications of having a low blood count, um, it's called pancytopenia, as well as complications of the immunosuppression. The patient during a, a stem cell transplant, they're in the hospital for a period of time, usually several weeks. That would depend a little bit on what the institution's practice is. And what are they doing during that time? They're getting chemo or chemo and radiation. They're getting other medications to prepare them for transplantation. And then the actual transplant looks like a blood transfusion in a bag. Um, it's not very exciting. And then it takes about a week or 10 days, sometimes more, for those cells to go back into the bone marrow uh, and start producing blood cells again so that it's safe for the person to leave the hospital. And then when they leave, they're going to be on medication, both intravenous and oral medication. At our institution, we really like the caregiver to begin to be involved with the transplant way before it happens, number one, to realize what their commitment will be and a little bit about the transplantation procedure. During the transplant, we actually have a place in the rooms where they can sleep um, if they want, and that's really helpful to the patient all right, some of it's social. It's very boring sitting in the hospital, and it's good to have somebody to talk to. But, but the patient doesn't feel well often, and it's nice to have an extra person there to speak for them, to help them get things. And then after the transplant, really, the patient may not be as functional as they were before. They may not have such a great appetite. They may feel a little weaker than normal. Uh, and it becomes very helpful, obviously, to have someone to do things for you, like wash your clothes and make sure you eat, help you get to your appointments, maybe be a second pair of ears when you're hearing about what the medications are because they have to be done properly, uh, and certainly to help hang those medications, perhaps. Um, and again, just as moral support. It's a, you know, it's a challenging experience and one that is much better tolerated, I think, when you have support around you, aside from the medical team support. The medical professional care team includes a physician, usually the transplant physician, uh, their physician extender, it could be a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, uh, a clinic nurse. Uh, there's usually a social worker involved in the care of the patient uh, who has been following the patient even before the transplant, uh, the financial care person, uh, financial person from the from the medical team to make sure that the patient has, uh, uh, you know, their insurance issues are resolved and uh, because the patient is probably not working during this time. Uh, there is a dietitian who's involved and a physical therapist. That's, that's the least amount of people who are involved in the care. Some centers also involve a pharmacist uh, in the physician care team. The biggest risk um, for patients who undergo a transplant is uh, getting an unexpected infection. So the, um, the caretaker has to pay attention to the home environment, make sure it's thoroughly cleaned uh, before the patient comes home. Um, things like mold uh, can be deadly to the patient, so they have to make sure there are no moist areas in the home, there's no, um, you know, there's no mold uh, in the home environment, uh, and if there is, that has to be cleaned and removed before the patient can, can come in. 
Indoor plants can sometimes be a problem, particularly if there is um, a, a lot of earth or dirt around the plant. Uh, so again, this is related to the risk of mold infections. So th that has to be minimized. Pets can stay in-house as long as they are clean and vaccinated and the patient does not have to do, um, you know, sort of cleaning up after the pet. But otherwise, pets can stay um, in the home environment. Day-to-day -day life for the patient after transplant would depend on where they are or how far out they are from the transplant. In the immediate post-transplant period, uh, there is a lot of fatigue. So I always tell my patients that they, they should expect a lot of fatigue when they get home, even if they don't feel that in the hospital. Um, they will feel tired, so they should allow themselves to take naps if they need to during the day, uh, while trying to increase their activity slowly. Food is an issue. Most patients don't have much of an appetite. Um, we have to tell them that food is like medicine for them. Part of the reason they don't have much of an appetite is because they've lost their taste buds as a result of the transplant. It takes about a good three months for the taste buds to come back. Uh, there's also some degree of nausea that may persist, so they really don't want to eat much. And, and yet food is important for their recovery, so somebody has to make sure they take enough calories. After an allo transplant, I think the, the schedule would vary very much depending on how far away you are from the transplant. So as an example, the first 90 days are particularly important to monitor for things like acute graft versus host disease. There are many more medications that are given. There are many more visits to the physician. Um, and it's a, a fairly intense period of follow-up. After the first 90 days, some of the medications may be tapered off, or at least the taper is initiated. The patient may be doing a little bit better. Perhaps their appointments aren't quite as frequent, although they're still going to be fairly frequent. Uh, and at least at our institution, uh, we start tapering the immunosuppressive drugs at the six-month mark. Um, so there's still a lot of follow-up that's happening as we taper off the medications and constantly uh, having the patient and uh, the medical team monitoring for symptoms or signs of graft versus host and of infection. And that's something that we have to really um, be very vigilant about, um, particularly in the first year after transplantation. If they have evidence of infection, then they may require intravenous antibiotics. Sometimes they are administered at home, so that's something for the patient to expect. Um, home infusions can happen. Another part of their life is, is frequent doctor visits, usually twice a week for the first three months. So uh, however far they, remain, they live from the, uh, the transplant center, they will be required to go in to you know, visit the doctor at the transplant center at least twice a week. And those days could be long, particularly if they require blood transfusion that day. Um, so it could, or, or some other infusion, so unexpected things can happen. So, so that takes up a lot of their time. As they recover from the immediate complications, then the biggest risk remains infection. So they have to be very careful in their environment about being around people who are sick um, or may have rashes, um, things like that. And they have to make sure that everybody washes their hands or uses Purell. Or, you know, so, so cleanliness and hygiene are very important. After a transplant, um, the, the kind of evaluations will vary, again, depending on how far away from the transplant the person is. So in the beginning, there's a lot of monitoring for graft versus host symptoms and signs. There's a lot of blood tests that are being monitored, both for drug levels and, and for other uh, indicators. Um, there's a lot of going over, the, over and over the medications to make sure the patient is being compliant, that it's clear what the doses are, because there's often a lot of medications and they're new to the patient. And as time goes on, um, I think there's less and less direct questions about graft versus host, although there's still gonna be questions about it, assuming that the patient now knows what everybody's looking for. There's gonna be less and less medications, uh, but there's pretty much always going to be blood tests and some concern about uh, graft versus host. And of course, uh, usually a clinical evaluation for the disease itself. I myself don't do a lot of scanning. I, I do scans a couple of months after the transplant to document remission, but I don't continue to do scans. But in other institutions or in an individual situation, there may be scans involved uh, because obviously we're not only concerned about the transplant and its possible ill effects on the patient, but its good effects is the you know lymphoma still gone. 
For an allogeneic stem cell transplant patient, the visits are um, follow-up care involves um, frequent doctor visits. We typically recommend twice a week for the first three months, and it, it is to check their blood counts. It is to check their uh, immunosuppression levels to make sure they have no unexpected complications. Uh, a, a thorough visit. It's a, it's a physician visit usually. Uh, and then just basically monitoring them for different viral infections, graft-versus-host disease, um, and, and other complications of transplant. It might be helpful for patients to speak with other patients that have been transplanted to get a, a better idea of the nuts and bolts of what it involved, what some of the feelings were that the patient had, uh, how difficult it was or wasn't to be compliant with the post-transplant routines. I think it might be helpful to get even another perspective from just the educational one from the medical team. The important thing is that the patients need a lot of support through this process. and and, and uh, um, a good, you know, caring family member, uh, a good caring team of uh, physicians as well as their physician extender team, uh, really what makes for a successful transplant.